All right. Hello, everybody. I think we'll, uh, we'll make a start. Um, thanks very much for joining this webinar. My name is Ginny Barber. I'm the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, and I think I know a few people, quite a few people on the call today. Just the usual logistics as before. This is being recorded. It'll go up on the website with the slides afterwards. Um, keep your microphones off and your, your cameras off if you don't mind. Um, Please do type into the chat and I will make sure that uh, I ask them of Caitlin afterwards um, and if we don't get to everything we'll, we'll do some follow-up. Um, we're tweeting, we're on um, Open Access ANZ and we've got the hashtags at the bottom OA Week, OA Week 2020 and Open Access Australasia which I'm delighted to say we're sort of managing to um, uh, get going. So just a uh, a formal thing before we start. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today. So I'm in um, Brisbane, Southeast Queensland. So that's the Turrbal and Niagara people. Um, I encourage you all to think about whose land that you're on. If you'd like to write that into the chat, you're very welcome to do so. Um, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present, emerging, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be here today. Um, and just to recognize that the theme of this year's Open Access Week is around diversity and inclusion and um, we've had some fantastic sessions this week about that already and um, it's an incredibly important time to be thinking about that in the context of um, open research. Um, and so today's session, this, uh, this is the last uh, uh, talk of the of the week, um, almost the last session. Um, I'm delighted to um, that Caitlin Faney agreed to talk to us from New, New York where it's late in her evening and I'm just really appreciative of her time. Caitlin is the executive director at Invest in Open Infrastructure. She's been a sort of towering figure in the open movement for a number of years and is just an also delightful person to work with. Uh, her career includes working at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, the Mozilla Foundation, uh, she's on the founding team for digital science and she's been involved um, in many other initiatives including the Board of Lyricists and, um, uh, and has served as the board chair of Code for Science and Society. So her knowledge in this area is just enormous. So thanks very much, Caitlin, and uh, welcome to the talk. Thank you, Ginny. Um, it is a, a real privilege to be with you all today. I'm gonna just get some slides up here in one moment. Should be like a seasoned vet in this by the end of this. Great. Can everyone see the full screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so huge, huge thanks again to to Ginny and the organizers for um, the invitation to join you all. Um, this week's open access uh, or this year's open access week theme, you know, third year running around taking action towards building structural equity and inclusion into our systems. Uh, we take quite seriously, especially talking about the underlying infrastructure and the tools and systems that and you know enable dissemination and access and discovery of knowledge. So I'll be telling you a little bit more about that and our work to date so far. Um, and again, um, making these slides available to you, you all afterwards as well. Just as a quick uh, high level, um, we'll be going through a couple of key areas here as well as speaking to some of our work over the past seven or eight months um, since I've been in this role particular. Um, as Ginny had mentioned, I've spent uh, the last 15 plus years or so in broader open movement based uh, spaces and also working within research, but also in broader knowledge infrastructure, um, largely on the programmatic and strategic side, but also for the last three years prior to invest in open infrastructure, building a, an endowment for Wikipedia and other free knowledge sites. So sustainability is something that's really deep in my core um, and thinking about the infrastructure that again, underlies our, our work as broader sector. And I wanted to start by thinking about how we're defining open infrastructure, especially for the context of this conversation. Uh, open infrastructure, it is a mouthful. It is a lot to, uh, it's a large, large word, a lot to say, also comes with a lot of connotations depending on who you're talking to. Um, we take a pretty broad, uh, broad approach to this, at least for the, these sorts of conversations, thinking about the tools and the services and systems that underpin both research and scholarship. Um, and more so looking to meet people where they are when they talk about the systems that they rely on um, and how those can intersect and where we can find efficiency and support. A little bit about Invest in Open Infrastructure or IOI. 
Um, our aim, we were uh, started to really think about this idea of creating a, sh a, a shared, interoperable, and community-driven network of tools and services to advance scholarly research, um, really premised on this idea here. Um, that you know the funding for this space is not coordinated, um, leading to perceived levels of scarcity for the the tools and the systems and um, other means of uh, you know, accessing knowledge in the space, as well as the fact that um, you know the resourcing and by resourcing I'm talking here about some of the staffing and you know participation contributorship sides of things when it comes to open technology that there are areas there we can be operating in more effective spaces um, to really ensure the long-term sustainability and maintenance of the space so i'll be talking a little bit more about that over the course of the next the next hour why this why now um, i love this this was uh, shared recently through, uh, it was for an event around accessibility, access, um, but, you know, WWW is a hashtag for it. Um, you can click through the link and, and kind of see the other coverage. But really this idea that, you know, we, we're, in this, we're in this moment, not only with the sort of confluence of various crises, um, you know, from whichever angle you wanna talk about it. I mean, I'm here in New York City where, you know, the pandemic and the economic crisis have completely ravaged uh, and affected everyone's life, the social justice and, and racial and equity um, elements um, that have long predated this current moment in time, that, but that we've seen really come to a head over the last few months. Um, even the climate crisis, the way that we are um, looking at some of those elements now, but recognizing that, you know, there's a lot about our current system that has come into stark contrast, uh, especially over the last few months in terms of problems that we really need to not only address um, as a community, but also to strategically think of ways in which we can you know, not utilize this moment as a way to just lock in the current way of doing things and, and keep it that way, but also think through other means of uh, potentially changing that system. On a high level, just to outline a few issues that have shaped our thinking for, for IOI, you know, starting with usage and interoperability, um, for researchers starting their studies today, I know PhD programs in the United States and North America can be quite longer uh, than in other parts of the world, but you know, the workflow tools that um, researchers are starting with today, there are many that are at risk of, of collapse um, based on being supported by their brittle funding models, uh, contributorship models, um, open source, which is chronically underfunded. Um, we're also facing issues when it comes to discoverability cost and access, especially as we reflect on this week's open access um, theme. Uh, interoperability, uh, the ideas of data ownership and data sovereignty, who gets access to the information that we put into these systems or the systems collect on behalf of us, and also trust, um, especially as we see commercial entities start buying up these pieces of infrastructure largely for uh, the data that they collect about their users, being you all and the researchers and, and communities you serve. On the resourcing side, you know, we are now facing more tool options, uh, which is wonderful from an innovation standpoint, but facing more options than we have funding to sustain it, um, leading to a perception of resource scarcity. I'm a firm believer that there are always pockets of resourcing that can be more effectively um, purposed for this. So you'll notice that in thinking about this, rather than saying increase the funding, I, I like to think of it as improving the funding because I uh, am not sure we quite know how much is already there to be reallocated. Um, but also recognizing that this is leading to a sense of heightened competition by having there be competition for you know, what seems like a limited amount of grant funding or limited amount of institutional funding uh, that's you know, leading some of these infrastructure providers and tools and services to, you know, instead of finding means of working together to be more modular and more supportive of one's work, to allow that expertise to shine, uh, instead putting them at odds with one another to build new features, to compete over grant dollars, and a marketplace that's really increasingly driven by cash-rich, commercially motivated players. Funding for tools in the space is often time limited. Uh, maintenance is still a, a cost that we are trying to wrap our heads around, so we even know what to ask for. And 
you know, for especially if you're looking at grant funding, there's usually an upper bound to how much support you can get before, um, you know, priorities either shift or, you know, projects pivot. And the funding is, is usually designed to support new things, uh, new features, new developments, rather than sustaining and maintaining operational cost. And so cost, you know, this leads to a challenge in how we account for, you know, the support that we need and how we ask for that support and how that's factored into our systems and our budgets. Uh, and the work that we are looking to do for IOI is to help shed some light on that so that we can be more informed and more strategic about the supports we need to be able to um, enable the work that we would like to do in the open. And on the development side, uh, institutions, universities, research labs have long supported these sort of platform sized um, efforts, whether it's repository services, research data management, computational tooling, um, long been key innovation drivers developing many of these technologies and systems too, but also recognizing that it has come at a cost, you know, open isn't free. And so again, you know, what are those invisible costs that, you know, come from staff time, in-kind development, all of these other elements that are not necessarily accounted for beyond overhead. And at the end of the day, being up against vendors who can offer better support, better lobbying, better marketing, uh, customer service, end-to-end -end services, um, and reliability with focused sales and delivery challenges um, makes it easier for institutions to choose some of these commercial systems that may not be as aligned with the values of the academy for sake of efficiency and sake of ease rather than thinking about um, you know, the longer term ramifications uh, and responsiveness of having investments in community owned and governed technology. And I'd be remiss if I didn't focus, especially with this week's theme, on the issues of equity and access, um, especially for invest in open infrastructure, where we're looking at supporting decision makers, institutional, as well as funders, other budget owners, infrastructure providers, but um, supporting decision makers with strategies and other insights so that they can make better decisions um, about how to support open technology. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize the systemic inequities that are stacked in that space. And I say stacked very deliberately, not only for this question of who are these technologies designed for, um, but also recognizing the um, inherent inequities that exist when we start talking about open source and open technology, layering that into the other systemic inequities that exist with knowledge production, institutions, um, the origins of higher education. And then beyond that, when we ta start talking about funding and investment, what that means for not only capitalism, but then for longer term horizons, if we're looking to sustain this over, um, over a period of time. These systems often favor the well-resourced Western, including male, um, in many cases, uh, scholars. And we need to be very conscious of you know, what we're choosing to support what we're choosing to recommend to make sure that we are not exacerbating the systemic inequities we know exist um, and creating multi multi-level barriers to participation knowledge exchange resourcing and equitable access countering our shared values uh, and so you know wondering what voices are missing from this discussion but then also doing the work to build these um, frameworks and even anti-racist frames to think through how we can you know actually you know, move forward to address um, these, these challenges. And so one of the things, so I, as I mentioned, you know, been in this role since just beginning of this year, uh, as Ginny knows, she's been involved with IOI. Um, my, my first day on the job was when New York City went, on, went into lockdown. Um, and so we very quickly were brought into a, you know, a moment in time to, really think about, okay, if we're talking about investments in open technology and, you know, increased demands for the access and, and services that are provided by many people here on this call, but, um, but also by institutions and also looking at unprecedented budget cuts and ramifications and uncertainty. What are measures of resilience? How can we start to pull from other examples and how this has been um, addressed in, in other sectors to possibly learn how to, how to react in this moment? I like to think of these two measures of resilience that um, Siddhartha Mukherjee back at the beginning of the pandemic um, was reflecting on in a piece in the New Yorker, which I'll make available 
afterwards, um, thinking of the time to survive and time to recovery, looking at supply chain dynamics. On the time to survive, thinking about how long can an enterprise endure with a shortage of a critical good, um, and time to recovery about how much time to, does it take to restore, to restore the, those supplies of those critical good there. Um, these two together are uh, often reflective of, you know, what the responsiveness um, in a crisis, your system, uh, what, what responsiveness your system has. And so thinking of, you know, when we start looking at what this means for the current space that we're operating in and the support and, and the ways in which this is impacting institutions worldwide, thinking of that, you know, reflective point of do we double down and lock ourselves in to the current way of doing things for the sake of continuing levels of service as we know them? Um, do we make decisions based on the immediacy to choose a certain provider that we know could get stood up very quickly, but might actually be you know, more inflexible over the course of time or you know, not have the same returns? Or do we take this time to pause, to think, and to work together to you know, reflect on where we want this, where we want the academy to be? and how we want the system to operate and, and what sort of supports we want to have for our, our open technology that we've invested so much time and labor into. Um, I will also just note that you know, the, the threats of disaster capitalism are real. Um, the exploitation of a sudden crisis for a private profit um, is a kind of formal definition of disaster capitalism, if you're unfamiliar with the term, um, and was made popular by the author of the shock doctrine um, and, and journalist Naomi Klein, thinking of you know, this crisis like earlier ones could be well be the catalyst to shower aid on the wealthiest interests in society, including those most responsible for our current vulnerabilities. We've seen examples of this this past week with the announcement from Nature and Max Planck Society to roll out a, a new open access plan where it's 11,000 pounds per article. Uh, and you know, really looking at that shifts in balance of the profit margins of open access through commercial publishers, um, which is warping, in my opinion, uh, the broader democratization and equity elements, uh, especially this week where we are focusing so deeply on, on those issues. And so with our work, you know, we've been really delving into with a number of um, institutional leaders in the space and research organizations, a few kind of key questions. And I'll pose these out to the group as well. You know, what counts as open, or critical, or necessary in our context when we talk about open infrastructure? Who does it serve? Who gets to decide? Whose needs come first? And then also, how do we reconcile tensions and conflict within our departments, within our institutions, within our societies? And, and what does risk look like? Where can we collectively work to address that as a community? Um, the history of IOI, uh, we began out of an event called the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools Workshop in 2018. A group of individuals that got together at that event, you know, looking at some of the sustainability challenges that they were acutely facing and wondering if there was an entity focused and dedicated to not only mapping the landscape, but looking at models and systems to approach, you know, what is what was causing the sort of inherent competition between various players, what that could look like. Um, in 2019, we got some starter funding for um, Invest in Open Infrastructure from Schmidt Futures and also from the Sloan Foundation. And in 2020, I joined. Um, and really, you know, our, from 2018, the work of you know, mapping out all of the various tools to the point prior about you know, how do we sustain all of these various elements. You can recognize a number of different open and even closed tools here in this mapping, and this has only grown since then. Um, the work of uh, the individuals behind IOI on our steering committee, of which Ginny is also a member, um, also set out to start to see what in the landscape already exists. This was one piece of that as a melon funded study um, to run a census of infrastructure providers to not only enlist their help to help um, better understand who some of the key players were, but then also to delve into understanding some of the things that are uh, inherent to their business models and technical decisions to understand again, a little bit more information there. Um, and again, I will make all of these links available. But we really, uh, going back to March and April, started to sink into, okay, what are some key assumptions? What are some things we should be designing for as we move forward to try to navigate this uncertainty and these um, you know, certain challenges that were coming down the pike? 
and really thinking about where we can be most helpful, not just in you know the immediate term, but looking ahead six to nine months, 12 to 18 months. And so really thinking about you know openness as something that is not only going to be more radically accepted, um, but also demanded post-crisis. Uh, the key infrastructure pieces are at risk of going out of business. And unfortunately, we're already seeing some of these things happen or some of these sustainability challenges come to light. I mean, we should plan for that reality. That the funding landscape is going to be radically different. And again, we've already seen a number of different iterations of that manifest and, and additional waves I know are hitting different geographic regions at different moments in time. Um, and really encourage others to think beyond their walls for shared models, interoperability, places where we can build portability and redundancy into our work. And also that our investments in technology at an institutional level or otherwise and our choices will be under heightened scrutiny um, for mission alignment, for cost, for efficacy, for levels of service, for values of users, and also external influence. For IOI, we approach this in a few ways. Uh, we conduct research, which some members of this call are a part of. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, we conduct research to help build out our evidence base so we can answer these questions about, you know, what are some of these shared needs? What are the baselines? You know, where is this affecting certain members of the community? But also, you know, where are their funding gaps? Where are their concentrations? And also, where are their gaps in support in the space? What can we learn from that? Um, how much money is being invested in this space based on a couple of key key questions. And we craft resources to help others make decisions uh, and also align uh, with some investment decisions to start in, you know, again, improving the funding and resourcing for the space. And then we work to put that into action by piloting solutions and coordinating stakeholders, not only through events like JROS, which we'll be holding again this December, but also thinking about, okay, what are funding mechanisms that we might be able to bring people together to start testing out? And what does that look like in this current environment? The current research effort, uh, we have um, a project that's underway that is running to the end of this calendar year uh, that is designed to help support decision makers, uh, especially when it comes to open the future of open scholarship. Um, this came out of a call by a number of institutional leaders to think of some shared means and collective, not only models for funding, but also collective action supports to hedge against future infrastructure collapse to impact that would impact um, you know, scholarly communications and scholarly publishing. Uh, we've, you know, over the course of the month of July and August, we did 54 interviews um, with 90, we've got 98 participants across 18 countries and five continents that are participating. Um, with a concentration, yes, in North America, um, it was self-selected. Um, we started this work uh, and opened this call at the end of um, end of June with 16 participants and very quickly grew out of that demand. And this work is to really look at, you know, over the course of a couple of key areas, you know, where are there near, medium, and long-term interventions we can work towards? You know, what does it look like to share resources and risk to address the certain, you know, common challenges that are being um, faced and what can we learn together? One of the key items there uh, that we have dug into, and this was from just this past September, we're really starting to understand, you know, when we talk about values alignment, what are we designing for? Um, and I, I mentioned these here. These are these came from those working sessions about you know maximizing opportunity and participation, embracing diverse perspectives, um, prioritizing care and compassion, operating with integrity, um, centering justice and equity in the work that we do. And um, because I do think that it is important to recognize what are we what are we designing for and how are we designing our systems and what can we do when we are operating across larger groups of individuals and, and perspectives as well. And then the next phase of it was really looking at, you know, what are the values and principles we want to apply to some of the decisions um, that, we that we're making. And we're in the process now of generating a number of recommendations for this group where we'll be putting this to the test. These were some of the top line items that kind of came up and while we were um, doing this work. You know, some of them might look very familiar in terms of governance, transparency, trust and integrity, um, reciprocity and reliability of the services. Um, but also what, especially as we're looking at using this to apply to making technical decisions and, and comparisons between certain services uh, to serve researchers and, and faculty. 
um, thinking of items such as competitiveness. Um, what is the market influence? Are others, you know, validating this work through their involvement and investment? Um, what does it look like in terms of accessibility, language diversity, reducing barriers? Are there common APIs? Um, and then, you know, there was a number of elements there around like transformative influence. Does this actually help us get to a different state or does this lock us into the current way we've been doing things, but just a different tool like slots in and affordability, you know, transparent pricing and countering, countering lock-in. Some of the key tension points that have come up in this work are, areas that I think are kind of commonly shared, you know, when it comes to the time that's available to be invested in these, in this decision making or in these, in the building of these tools, you know, versus what's available. How do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile the immediacy of some of the decisions and some of the services that are needed to be um, spun out, especially in response to crisis, crises that are hitting in, in waves at institutions around the world? In terms of prioritization, how do we balance that near-term versus long-term gain? How do we balance the need to support foundational infrastructure that we may have invested quite heavily in at an institution with you know, skills training as well as funding and capital um, and adoption with also holding space for newer projects and, and different approaches? Whose values get applied? How open are we looking for these um, for these services, as well as you know systems that are favoring usual suspects and bigger players versus some others? What is, how can we actively counter some of that in terms of our own perceptions, um, and then also some of the resourcing trade offs and and influence that comes along with some of these efficiencies, and we see this particularly in areas of the world that you know really question reliance on services that are held in different parts of the world you know, infrastructure that might be routed through, you know, groups like Google and Amazon when there is issues around data sovereignty and challenges there as well. And so some of the key issues there, and we'll be sharing more about this through the end of the year. And then, you know, kind of in closing, when we talk about some paths forward and navigating this complexity, we, we think about it in kind of three key areas. You know, near term, how can we work with the existing systems and investments we have? You know, what does that mean in terms of getting our systems to talk to one another more effectively without having to overhaul or migrate completely so that we can build resilience into the work that we already have? On the medium term, what does it mean to leverage our existing consortia, our existing networks, our existing frameworks to more effectively serve the needs as they evolve? and to reflect some of these um, elements that we've talked about over the course of this past week through these you know, sessions that, have been, you've been, that Ginny has been running. And then longer term, what does it look like to transform our models more, uh, more fully and thinking about how we can better pool our resources and risk together um, to ensure that we are you know, accounting for not only the labor and the um, the talent at institutions and the participation of others, but also looking at the sustainability when it comes to different funding mechanisms that can move beyond some of the more brittle mechanisms we have in place now. In conclusion, you know, I would encourage us all to participate and I think we are all needed to really ensure that we are challenging the systemic inequities that exist in the system across a number of different planes. Um, encourage this group to, you know, continually poke at and can and look to surface those invisible costs and barriers that might be keeping people from having access or participating or from uh, being recognized, especially when we start talking about open technology in terms of the service that goes into uh, maintaining that work, uh, governing that work, and contributing to that work. And also prioritizing care and equity and not only how we operate as, uh, as a community, but how we choose our platforms, how we engage in our systems, and also in all of our decision-making. We are here to help. Uh, and I look forward to moving this into our question and answers side of things. Thanks again. Great, thanks very much, Caitlin, that was, that was tremendous. And it is actually, it's just really refreshing at a time like this, I think, to hear um, that we're thinking about um, integrity and values and such like, because particularly in this space, it can sometimes feel like that is really not, not, a, not, not something that gets prioritised. So I think the kind of work that you're leading is, is incredibly important. Um, okay, so I've got some questions coming in and um, everybody just remind, please type them in the chat and I'll read them out. So the first one is, um, uh, so thanks for the very inspirational talk. <laughs> 
a question. What would success for IOI look like in 12 months time? It's a great question. Um, in 12 months time, I would say for us to be able to uh, be able to kind of report out on some of the, again, some of the hidden costs when it comes to maintenance and also when it comes to some of the existing levels of investment for some of the shared systems we have. Um, and I say that not on, not because it is, uh, I mean, it is in some ways uh, an intractable problem. We're starting to work towards this, but I'm a firm believer that if we are going to be making recommendations to others, we need to ground that in as much fact as possible and make that as accessible and approachable to others so that they have uh, visibility into how these systems operate and how they're supported before we start looking at some of that change. Um, and, you know, I will tell you, even in the U.S., if uh, you were to look at, say, between the U.S. and Europe, some of the top, top five funders of open research software, um, it is extremely difficult without, um, you know, a couple weeks, if not months of work, to tell how much money has been invested across um, those those different portfolios over the last three years, I and mean, to pull that number out, and you know that's that's a problem that keeps us from knowing what we're comparing, um, how much is enough, and be able to start having the discussions about what it means to adequately resource and staff some of these efforts, um, so that they are you know as competitive or as reliable or as supportive as you know some of these other counterparts that we're seeing on the commercial side. That's a great question, Michelle. So perhaps I can just ask one. I mean, I think that there's you you get you get came up with a lot of suggestions of what um what we might want to do. Um, oh, actually, this is very funny. Zoe's asked the question that I was going to ask, which is all right, perfect. So, what do you advise <laughs> the first few steps, or even just one, to create change for a decision maker? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Oh, oh. Um, so here's a here's a question back. Within an institutional context or outside of an institution? Uh, Zoe, would you like to comment on that? Outside, Outside of the institution. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think, in, you know, in terms of, let's see, let me think about that for a second. So a decision maker in an org, creating or maintaining open tools. Um, you know, in, in some ways, I'm a big fan and business strategy, building out your effort, and we've done this for IOI as well, of like continuously kind of thinking through, you know, who else is doing this work? What's working in that approach? Um, you know, should we be collaborating? If not, why not, right? Like in terms of some of the contingency planning there and, and also understanding what that value that is, is understanding, you know, where redundancy is good, where redundancy can be a challenge um, where it is a means of better saving time where you can build from. Um, some of those foundational questions I find uh, extremely helpful in terms of a, like a tangible first step just to understand where things are situated within the broader ecosystem. And I know we've had a number of questions over the um, time that I've been at IOI, but also more broadly over the number of, you know, last decade of being in the space about how projects should be interacting with one another or just operating on their own. And I think there's a value case for, for both, depending on the context. But I would say that as a, a first step to creating and maintaining open tools to really understand what that, you know, situational context is for that work. And then also thinking through, like, what does it look like if you were to succeed? What does it look like if you needed to merge a partner with another organization? And what does it look like if you need to spin down? Because some of the models in which these um, projects are supported, the external factors such as like the economic crisis right now can be a, a deal breaker. And to recognize how to not, you know, completely leave a, a community in the lurch, I think is a big, big, um, big challenge in many ways. Thanks, Clayton. I'm, I'm not sure that I think some your internet might be a bit glitchy or ours might be a bit glitchy. I don't know. Um, I'm not. I'm just, <laughs> hear me now. <laughs> so just sorry. That, this is. I think the, finally we've got to the end of the week, and the, you know, the internet's giving up on us. But it might be on my side. We'll hang on in there. <laughs> um, so, a question from Tanya: uh, Is an institutional repository considered an open tool? And do you perhaps advocate for larger country-based repositories rather than institutional-based ones? And of course, in Australia and New Zealand. Each institution has a very has a vibrant um, institutional repository, and it's a very live debate here. 
Yeah, it's a great question. And this is actually given the, the scholarship, the open scholarship focus and the representation from libraries in the re research effort that we're working on right now, institutional repositories is a big element of that, um, especially when it comes to some of the open offerings. And I know that there are some, some commercial offerings as well. Um, yes, I would say that in many cases, um, those are open tools with some exceptions, you know, for those that are relying on B Press, less of an open tool these days. Um, but in terms of advocating for larger country-based repositories rather than individual institution-based repositories, uh, I think it depends on your use. What I would advocate for is to uh, have a, you know, a means of, of interchange between those various systems. And this is something that we've heard uh, time and time again, you know, how can there be exchange or interoperability among these systems and thinking about is that mapping to a common API or have, um, you know, a certain form of metadata that allows for, uh, allows for that interoperability. And in some cases, like I am a big proponent of interoperability, but also like reflecting the current moment in time, thinking about if one of these open tools were to go away, could you get your content out and into another system. And what does that mean? I think we start talking about applying those open standards, thinking of those contexts as a resilience mechanism. It's also really important. Um, the other thing just to mention, and thank you, Jenny, for asking that clarifying question. Um, one other just element there is, I think that there's a real opportunity, but also potential tension between, you know, the institution-based repositories and larger offerings based on you know, levels of service you sometimes get in either of those, levels of customization, but then also what that you know, level of customization might mean for being able to update your system. Um, and we've seen, you know, particularly with some partners here in the US that have so heavily customized their version to plug into other things at their institution that they are in some cases two update levels behind and being able to, um, being able to upgrade their repository for fear of breaking all of the connectors. And so that can also slow down some other systems as well. That, that's a great question, actually. I, or a great, great um, yeah. sort of observation this business about how things are <laughs> being very interoperable and then all of a sudden they're really not. And uh, I don't think we, you know, we kind of forget that that is a real problem with them, um, sort of the federated level of these kind of um, yeah. um, works. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> so Margaret's asked a question about the yes. so the the virtual herbarium and the global bioinformatic. I can't remember what it stands for either. I'm afraid, but these are these are sort of large, yes. well-supported um, uh, mm -hmm. initiatives. And I, I guess the key, uh, just to ask, follow on from that question, really, is why is how we persuade those um, organisations to really. Um, I, uh, investment how we support investment in them in Australia we have um, the we have government funded investment in these types of things but it tends to often go to very big things like you know um, mm. square kilometer array and you know sort of enormous yeah. enormous uh, data gathering things rather than the underlying infrastructure that I think you're dealing with so maybe it'd be worth kind of reflecting on how we influence governments to invest in the right things I guess. It's a it's a big question, and I'm you know as someone who has spent time on the programmatic side, um, also doing analysis, and then um, as the you know expert, but then also on the fundraising end, I will say it always looks easier from the outside. You know, one of the things we sort of joke about is that it's easier to say what's not enough because in some cases there are rules over like what sort of things you can or cannot recommend. In some cases, rec using the word recommendations kind of violates certain um, decision making or governance rules. For example, in the US, you know, there's congressional authority for um, government funding agencies. And so you have to be very careful about walking that line. Um, but I would say that in terms of making the case for why these systems should be supported and what that looks like beyond the current membership model or beyond. I do think that there is a lot of opportunity there to make that 
case and to um, bring those those funders to the table, um, especially as we're starting to see those um, systems be put under extreme strain and, and uh, you know, need to be repurposed in ways that we, um, like sort of confluence of crises we're, we're in right now, where there's heightened awareness and there's heightened um, understanding that um, these key pieces of infrastructure are needed. And that's what I'm hoping for IOI to be able to help with in terms of mapping out what a strategy looks like for various funding, um, infra funding bodies that are involved in infrastructure to participate in looking at ways they can help better sustain this over the future. But that's it. I'm glad I'll have to take down that note about the virtual herbarium as well. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of these around. Um, in fact, yesterday we had lots of a couple of talks which talked on biodiversity, which yeah. is a real, really interesting kind of sort of angle for this. Um, yeah. This whole area. So, um, a question from from Thomas about open infrastructure is often funded by nonprofits, whereas closed proprietary alternatives have well-funded marketing departments um, in for-profit companies. So, what's the key to competing from the underdog position, which I guess we often all find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, it's a great it's a great question, Thomas. I I would say that in some ways, recognizing your the competitive advantage that might not necessarily be based on the same. You might not you know, not be able to compete on that same level, right? In terms of the resourcing that you'll find in these big um, for profit companies versus the open infrastructures. That said, we have seen some real successes in groups that are open at their core, that make their code and data available, and um, have become revenue neutral beyond uh, beyond you know being funded by nonprofits, and so I think that there is a real value that can be explored there. Um, I am unabashedly a fan of pulling learnings and examples from other sectors, not just within our current field, because uh, I think that that is the best way we can start to test out what is possible and where things may have you know been pressure tested so that we can you know, learn and potentially move faster and experiment. Um, but I will say that one of the big things I've seen is when it comes to competing from the underdog position, um, you know, understanding what that value add is and what distinct, you know, use that is serving and having that be very closely aligned with the needs of the community in terms of being community owned and operated um, can be in many cases such a such a much more compelling means of crafting you know products and infrastructures and systems uh, to not shy away from that and to, to recognize that value as well yeah i think that kind of takes us back to the whole heart of this of all of this it's all about community isn't it um i'm going to do mm -hmm. a famous plug for the um the session after this which is about advocacy and we'll be talking about finding your community a little bit about that as well um yeah. so Ooh. success and failures sorry I said success and failures. Can I give some yes, success and failures? Right, but not doing okay. it. Again, I think is really key. Yeah. So, what what um any instructive historical failures or disaster stories to avoid? Um, what what would you like to share from that? Well, I mean, and and just to quickly mention for for Zoe's question above, I think um, one of the uh, success stories that I think is a really great example right now. Um, many of you will be familiar with Impact Story and um, and Unsub. Um, from a group that's now known as Our, Our Research, um, Heather Kowar and, and Jason Priam. Um, they have created, you know, with everything still open, openly available, open source, um, based on open data, they have created a data pipeline that is so attractive that they have, you know, for-profit entities that are contributing to them to be able to weave that into their own, um, their own, you know, data pipelines. And now are um, having institutional relationships provide uh, levels of support because they are the the level of insight that they are providing is allowing institutions to cancel their big deal bundles with Elsevier with confidence um, living up to straight up what you find on their websites and I think that that's a huge huge success um, for an entity that is you know very data driven very rooted in community uh, values and um, and also you know comes from that community to continually hone a product that they have found to be so successful. Um, on, the, on the flip side, um, where revenue has not necessarily you know, been um, helpful in that regard, um, I think, uh, let's see, in, in terms of instructive failures or disaster stories, 
I mean, on, on some levels, I think we all are very quick to point to certain services that have been bought up by, uh, you know, the Elseviers, the Clarivates, the, um, you know, the digital sciences of the world. Um, I, I understand from an entrepreneurial perspective why some of that is done. Um, I think that there are also areas where that has left communities in the lurch, even if it was a for-profit product to begin with. Um, thinking of, you know, SSRN or B-Press, things that are often kind of held up. Um, on the other side of things, I would say in terms of some interesting other disaster stories, I think we're starting to see, and this is in the learning management space, some of the services that are being rolled out for remote learning that are really getting into surveillance um, and are jeopardizing the privacy and the security of the individuals that are um, involved. And in some cases, these are not only students, these are children. And so I think that, you know, in terms of how we, um, you know, how we examine our technologies and our choices, not only for, for lock-in, um, but also for governance, for transparency. Um, you know, we, there are a num number of stories that I think we can point to, you know, whether it's from open infrastructure or otherwise, or places where there's been no, little to no transparency about how much money has been poured into an open solution that is still not necessarily meeting the current need um, you know, whether it's in the repository or preservation space, um, how that money has been managed, what that, you know, has left a community in the lurch to do, um, and moving to other for-profit entities, so. It's late in the day on my time, yeah. Thomas. I'll come up with some better examples after. That's a great example. Well, sure. I th thank you, Caitlin. I think we'll, we'll wrap this up now. That was a fantastic session, really inspiring, and I, you know, I would encourage anyone that's not looked at, um, uh, invest in open to take a look at it and to um, kind of engage with the types of things that Caitlin's talking about um, and I feel like you know there's, it's clearly going to be doing great things over the next 12 months so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much Jenny it was such a pleasure and please feel free to reach out uh, we are here to help support you all and I hope you have a great last session for open access week. Thanks Caitlin.